Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to a special version of the Chai Time Data Science show where I talk to a complete company. In this conversation, I'm sorry, it's a conversation not a interview this time because I have mentioned a few of my own points in the conversation which I hope you enjoy or you may be excuse. But in this episode I talk with the complete sharpest mind team. Edward Harris, Russell Polery and Jeremy Harris. Yes the startup consists of just three people I've already had Ed on the show so please do check that interview out if you're curious where we talk a lot about Sharpest Minds and their business model In this interview we talk a lot about learning to learn the theme broadly speaking learning to learn applied to the business the startup and the data science world we discuss multiple ideas of how to get a break into the data science field how should you go about learning how should you go about putting projects on your resume what projects to put on your resume and when do you really know that you're ready for a job all of these ideas are discussed in this conversation sharpest mind team has been really putting out many of the future machine learning heroes so to speak so i'm really excited to be releasing this interview i hope you enjoy the conversation as much as i did a quick reminder this similar to all other episodes will have checked and uploaded subtitles so if you're not a non native english speaker please go to youtube and enable the subtitles for now here's my conversation about learning to learn and how to get your break into the data science field please enjoy the show Hi everyone I am really excited to be interviewing a complete company this time a complete startup on the show I have the complete sharpest minds team on the podcast uh, hello everyone if you could please introduce yourself and speak out your name for the audience that is joining in via the audio stream maybe we can start with the people who haven't completed a phd <laughs> <laughs> oh boy russell you want to go first yeah so um Russell Plary, I'm a CTO technically at Sharpest Minds. Uh, I was also one of their first users uh, way back in the day, um, and uh, I'm a PhD dropout. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is a, a bit of a trend in our company, though. There's there's an exception. Two thirds of a trend. <laughs> yeah, our, our CEO is a delinquent who actually completed his PhD. <laughs> an embarrassment. Um, yeah, well, I guess. Yeah, I guess I'm the second one. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeremy. I um, uh, I work with Ed and Russell, and I guess I'm uh, I'm technically the COO of the company. Um, I think Russell's title is probably the most meaningful because he actually does like deep technical work, whereas um, Ed and I kind of run around doing whatever needs to be done uh, other than the technical stuff. And um, anyway, so I guess my background is I dropped out of my PhD as well. Uh, about two years in, and um, went into stumbled my way through startups. Um, actually, with Ed back in the day, and then actually Russell joined very very early on, and I uh, went kind of a trio uh, ever since. So that's that's my background. Awesome. And uh, I'm Ed, and I'm the CEO of Sharpest Minds. Uh, most of what I do day to day is around um, uh, mentor uh, like mentor relations, mentor onboarding. Um, and uh, and helping mentees with careers and running webinars to help them uh, find jobs. I'm the one member of the team that actually did uh, complete the PhD, so I'm I'm a little uh, embarrassed about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, if you all could also give uh, any one of you, or maybe all of you, could give a quick introduction to Sapis Minds, and who all from the audience can sign up for it. I don't I don't mind diving into this one. Um, 
All right. So guys, correct me if I screw this up. Um, so Sharpest Minds is a mentorship program um, for aspiring data scientists that's completely free until you get a job. So the idea is you work one-on-one -on -one with a professional data science mentor who's working in industry. You build a typically a full stack data science product and um, they help you with software engineering best practices, with your code, with strategic thinking around it. We also help you with your job search. And then when you get hired, you repay a small portion of your first year's salary. Awesome. And uh, I'd also like to point out the scale. Uh, I think uh, it's it's been out there on Twitter, but if you could speak about the number of mentees that have been hired, the kind of, I, I like to call it machine learning heroes that you've generated, the kind of income you've generated for your mentees. And I also believe you're one of the first profitable ISAs. Yes, this is, uh, to, the, to the best of our knowledge, uh, that's true. Um, and having spoken to a few people in the industry, it seems to be true so far. Um, we, we've had now uh, almost 100 mentees hired. Um, and uh, I did tweet about this, but we, in, in 2019, we came uh, within a, a really tiny fractional percentage of our stretch goal of, um, of, of getting enough people hired to pay out uh, ultimately about half a million dollars out to our mentors. Um, and so this is great for our mentors because they get money. It's also great for our mentees because um, because of our business model, every dollar that our mentees, every dollar that our mentors make means that our mentees on average have made, you know, many, many more dollars than that. Uh, and so it's kind of, a, it tracks directly with how much value is being created um, for mentees by the mentors and by just the, the whole structure and system itself. Yeah. Awesome. Now I want to talk about your transition from the world of physics into the world of tech. Maybe Russell, if you could go first, what uh, led you to led you into the world of startups and did you have it all figured out or did you kept learning about all of these things uh, that you're currently working on? Yeah. So I, I like to say I, I sort of stumbled into startups. Um, I was pretty miserable doing my PhD in physics, um, ended up sort of quitting without a real plan. Um, and then one of my last days, Ed actually walks into our lunchroom. Um, I had known him a bit because he had worked in a, in a lab nearby. Um, and him and Jeremy had just recently started this company. And I think back then the business model was a bit different. It was um, something along the lines of let's take physicists, teach them data science and get them jobs. Um, so Ed comes in and goes like, you want to learn data science? And I go, yes, please. I don't know what the hell else I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> So that was like a, a chance encounter that sort of changed my life. Um, and after that, sort of, they started feeding me, uh, you know, TensorFlow docs and things like that. And I started just getting really into it. Um, landed my first role, uh, two month contract for another startup, thanks to these guys. Um, and afterwards I joined Sharpest Minds, I think, cause um, I guess they liked my hustle. We all got along and, and it's sort of, my well, life's never been different since or never been the same since, yeah. One of the, uh, one of the interesting things about um, Russell coming on board and just generally how that whole early point worked when we were transitioning from physics is you can kind of trace, like you can trace the, the lineage of um, the software engineering knowledge that we gathered from uh, almost like, almost like a, a mentor to, you know, almost mentee type way. Um, we actually were lucky enough to bring on, it's kind of funny now to think about it, but we brought on a really good co-op student from Waterloo, um, one of the universities here in Canada. And that student actually ended up teaching me everything, uh, everything that I could possibly learn for that first semester that he was there about software engineering. Cause I myself was a physicist. I didn't know anything at all about this sort of thing. Um, so I, I took this, just from working alongside him became a decent at software engineering, decent enough to just be able to um, help Russell along as he kind of onboarded uh, to, to, to learn himself. Um, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, Russell stayed on is uh, at least, you know, from, from our side is he learned so fast um, and we were all super impressed with that fast he learned. And then by a few months in, he just kind of, taken ownership of a huge part of the code base. And now he's running things. Um, I haven't done any software engineering myself in God, a year or maybe more than a year now. And Russell is just like completely, completely running things and self-taught. So you really can from like a running start, get to a really, really uh, sophisticated uh, position where you're actually building real stuff in production. 
and I will say it, it in a funny way sort of formed a key part of our, our DNA right? very early on. Russell came in and had like, he had a little bit of a, a ledge, just a tiny little, little push, a little bit of mentorship. And then it, this is one of the very unusual things for, for me, because this is not how my brain intrinsically works, but he, he has, he has a way where he'll just like, he'll dig deeper and deeper. And when he hits something he doesn't know how to do, he doesn't just panic. And that's something that um, I think, I think he's unusual in that respect. Uh, at least I, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm unusual in the sense that I do panic. Um, but what he'll do is just like relentlessly power through it. And then you end up with like, in, you know, week to week, if he's picking up one new skill each week, you, you might not notice it. But then you turn around a year later and you're like, ah, this guy could work anywhere. And um, we're just hoping he, uh, he doesn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to linger on to that point, Russell, if you could maybe, and uh, Ed has already quoted you as the most motivated learner self uh, who can pick up things by himself uh, that he's ever met. Can you tell us your secret and how did you pick up software engineering skills of, and we joked about this on Twitter, keeping the billion dollar operation afloat. uh, How did you get to that stage from coming from a non-technical background? Sure. I think uh, part of the advantage we have as physicists is something we like to call um, cocky physicist syndrome. And that's the idea that like, I'm a physicist. It's like the ultimate subject. I could learn anything. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of just ignorance out of how hard things are that uh, yeah. sort of lowers the barrier to get started, um, at least at first. Uh, but I think a lot of it was just like, you know, these guys hired me knowing that I didn't have a lot of the base knowledge, but they trusted me to learn. Um, And that kind of trust, I think, goes a long way. Um, You know, someone believes you can do it and it helps you believe you can do it. And, um, you know, trust in yourself to learn the things you need to is is a big psychological barrier you need to get over. Uh, And it helps if you've got like a mentor or a few, in in my case, that that can help you get that gap. Awesome. And you're also working at a startup, you're building products and you need to constantly be at the top of your game. You need to continuously improve your skills. How do you go about balancing that? Maybe you have a list of things that you want to explore and you also have a few deadlines that you want to make. How do you prioritize that? Prioritization is hard. Um, One lesson we've learned over the past is like, you should really just focus on like one, maybe two things. yeah. So like one thing that can hold you back is like having a long list of, of things you want to get done and because that mm-hmm. those just stress you out and you're, you're almost less likely to start. Um, so business wise, um, the, the lesson we learn over and over again is what's the next thing we're going to do? What's the next thing we're going to build, et cetera, et cetera. And as far as like personal development goes, um, uh, I make sure to build in like habits. So you know, startup life is busy. It's really hard to, uh, to make time to like continuously improve on things that might not be relevant at the time. Um, so at least myself, I make sure I schedule explicitly in my day, uh, every day, some time for, for like learning. Like this is my time. I'm going to learn something today. It might just be five minutes, but it's, it's going to be that every single day. And that, that starts to add up. And I, do, I do also want to point out that like, it's, it's easy to hear that and think, cause most people will say something like that. If you ask them, you know, uh, how do you how do you set time aside for personal growth, personal development? And they'll say, well, I, you know, I schedule time. And then we all kind of know that that's more <laughs> of a kind of an aspirational I schedule time. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm here to tell you firsthand, when um, when we hit the towards the end of a, a workday, Russell at his desk will pull out a piece of paper and you'll see him start to write out like a, a plan of how he separated out his day. And it's like a ritual that he goes through and actually acts on. It's really, it's prompted me, and I know it's prompted Ed as well to do similar things. And, and, and that emphasis on habit formation is like, I think especially for technical people, you might not be inclined to respect the importance of things like habit formation. You, you might have the attitude that, look, if it's not a technical problem, it's not of interest to me. But technical problems are actually meta problems. Very often, they're, they're problems about productivity, they're problems about the way that you tackle problems. Um, so to avoid spinning your wheels, to avoid wasting time, to avoid failing yourself over and over, learning how to set goals in a realistic way, which I think it's fair to say we've kind of learned from Russell throughout this process more than anything else, um, I, I think that's just such a, a key thing uh, at any stage of the process. One, one place you can find more information about this actually 
Uh, I don't think Russell will plug this himself, but I'll plug it for him. <laughs> he actually has a personal blog, um, russellpolari.com, yeah, where he's, yeah, I'll say russellpolari.com. Um, uh, it's about productivity, maintaining habits, and like how to, it, it kind of also goes through the learnings that we as a team have gone through. Um, a lot of like, a lot of stuff where, you know, we used to do two or three hour meetings where we just wouldn't get anything done, just brutal, brutal stuff. Um, and now we're down to like really brief meetings. Where we quickly get decisions done. There's a whole process around that, that um, Russell's just been like documenting because he, you know, he's, he makes a point of writing. Um, and it's great because it's become kind of this documentation that we ourselves can come back to, but it's like anyone can check it out. Um, and if you're interested in personal productivity, great place to start. And I, I will also say, I think a big theme and a through line in the, uh, in the self-improvement sort of area is this question of identity as well. Because um, we've sort of seen transformations in our, our identities over the course of all this. And I think a lot of that's also gonna be explored in Russell's blogs, but just to kind of bring it to the fore here and, and Russ you might speak to this as well. Like uh, we all obviously had identities as physicists going into this. Uh, that led to, as Russell points out, cocky physicist syndrome, this idea that I study something so fundamental that this must generalize. Um, it's not possible for me to overfit uh, because I'm learning the fundamental laws of the universe. And anybody, uh, if, if I walk into a room, people need to listen because I'm the one with all the <laughs> secrets, right? Um, so there's a, a version of this. Um, I, th I think it's a common problem for technical people of, of all kinds. It, it um, Breaking that down, breaking through that and changing your identity to be about uh, self-improvement and to recognize the value of processes and, and, and habits, is that's like an identity transformation. It, it's much more fundamental than just doing certain things every day. It's being open to the possibility that things like meditation, that things like, um, like studying habit formation and reading the literature on habit formation might actually have intrinsic value. So just tossing that out there. Or even listening to a podcast where we talk all about it might help you. I, I think yeah. it's, it's also learning how to make sacrifices. Everyone would love to be a great coder. Everyone would love to be a Kaggle grandmaster. It's, it's easy. It's fairly easy. You just need to set aside one or two hours dedicated time every day to achieve whatever you want in a few years. It's, it's that straightforward, but we default to our leisure timings. We default to whatever we like to enjoy. I, I think it's also about how do you keep yourself motivated to continue doing it when the honeymoon period of the habit gets over and you so, sort of step into the marriage period of the habit. We default to our defaults. Exactly. Well, and, so, and I think Russell's um, written a lot about this. Russell, I don't know if it, this is my, maybe a good time for you to talk about just like the atomic habit principle. Well, uh, yeah, this, this I think happens, you know, every new year, someone goes, okay, I'm going to go to the gym every week or I'm going to learn this new language, this data science language or something like that. And um, like you get this burst of willpower uh, and you probably can keep it up for a few weeks uh, and then you lose it, right? That you've got sort of a limited amount of willpower. And so you end up say now I did not make it to the gym the last few days and I'm extremely demotivated. And I start to label myself as a failure. I didn't make it to the gym. I'm not someone who can do it. Yada, yada, yada. So like, the sort of counterintuitive advice that I always give is like, okay, lower your expectations big time. Like start really small and prove it to yourself that you can keep this up for a long time. And then maybe, uh, you know, raise your expectations a bit and, and go for longer. But I think the mistake that I see myself making over and over again and other people making over and over again is, is setting your expectations too high for yourself. Yes, you can achieve anything, but not right away. It'll take time. Yeah. For sure. I, I'm, I hold the opposite view, even though I do set micro goals, I, I follow the rule of public embarrassment. For example, one goal that I put out publicly is I want to lose 15 kgs in this year. I literally told everyone, every person I walked into the gym with everyone at work to the extent that they're bored of now. And I follow the rule of public embarrassment. Now I have to make it to the gym. I, I did lose four kgs in the first month of working out. So. Even nice. though the, on the second day, I couldn't pick up weights, I knew I have to figure this out. So that's, I, I don't want to debate this, but that's also an extreme and that may or may not work for the person. I think a totally awesome. valid strategy. Oh, well, I think what you're doing is putting skin in the game, right? So you're going to have a reputational cost if you screw up. Uh, and that's also super effective. 
Yeah, I, I don't know that they're necessarily mutually exclusive too, because you know you might say, hey, I'm I'm setting a goal to, and, and here I'm I'm stealing what what Russell literally did, which was uh, he said he you know I want to start working out, so I'm going to do one push up a day, right? And you can say, all right, I'm setting my goal to do one push up a day. Um, you can be public and atomic in your in your habit formation, even if maybe one push up a day sounds to others like a, a low goal. You're you know it, it's all about continuing. For sure, I think another aspect where this comes in is the business world where you need to, I, I'm not from the business world, but through Silicon Valley or whatever TV shows I watch, you need to show your investors a deck where you project your annual growth and you also need to show them your mi- micro goals. Can you mm-hmm. speak about the things you've learned while in the business world? And I know Ed and Jeremy, you both were working together before you started Sharpest Minds. Was that experience helpful or did you have it all figured out? Did you pick up any things that you'd like to share? Did we ever not have it all figured out? Uh, I would say that uh, things only really started to click for us uh, in terms of everything, process, um, uh, like idea, all of that stuff. Uh, Maybe in mid uh, 2018, I would say, Uh, not that long ago, you know, 18 months or so, something like that. Um, After YC. After YC, that's right. Um, it's it was like this really intensive period of hard work that after it was over forced us to take a step back and think, okay, you know, um, we're beating our heads against this, but maybe we're beating our heads against the wrong thing. Um, it takes you know, it takes like a, a really trying with everything and then like falling short to actually force you to step back and be like, okay what are we might be doing wrong? What assumptions do we have that we have to question about ourselves? Um, it's very hard to, you know, fake this or come up with this realization by just trying to force yourself. You have to really try and then really fail in order to be able to look at yourself and be like, what is it that, that we need to improve? And so that's kind of when we started to really, um, the this, this systematization, um, just process around meetings, um, the idea that like, now that we'd failed, we had nothing to lose. So uh, we might as well just try an idea with minimum effort, see if it got traction, and if it didn't, go to the next thing. And that's how this this um, uh, ISA program started. It was like I forget how how long it took us to spin up, but like it was it was a few days. Like the 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 prototype was a few days. Um, the prototype was a, a Google Drive folder with a bunch of resumes in it that. Uh, we would point mentors to and go like, hey, who do you want to interview to be a mentee? And that was it. We had no support whatsoever. We had absolutely no infrastructure, nothing, nothing at all. And it was only after we started to actually see mentors and this stuff pick up that we were like, okay, it's worth building an app. Whereas, um, you know, a, a year or two before that, we'd been like, let's build an app. And then, you know, then maybe people will come to it. Um, whereas whereas this this, we just like, shed those inhibitions completely into the reverse. I think a, a big through line there too is like learning, learning how to build value for real people. Um, it's, it's always tempting and seductive to um, overfit to your own preferences and think that you, know, you can cock this image in your mind of, what your, of who your user is and what they want and what their blockers in life are. And then you go out and you, you build something for them. But until you it, it's more than just talking to your users. You have to like, you have to empathize. You have to get to know your users. You have to make them your friends. Like to this day, um, like I do, I do kickoff calls with every single mentee. I think we've had over 240 now go through the program. Okay. Every single time I do a kickoff call with the mentee and their mentor. And like Ed does calls, interviews with every single mentor who comes through the platform. Um, all three of us, we make a, make a point of mentoring people actively through the program as well so that we understand what it's like to be on the other side of that. And like, it's only through that obsessive kind of embedding in that, that matrix that you realize, oh wow, like people are having a hard time with this aspect of the signup that we thought was obvious, or this is the part of the job that's actually the hardest, and here's how we can tackle it, that, that sort of thing. And this is the kind of business too, like I think, I think Jimmy's absolutely right there, where it's like, it's, all, like, it's almost like our users are our friends in a way. Um, the way that our business is structured because it forces us to make sure like, yeah, like we don't make money until this person is successful. 
the same relationship type dynamics that apply to mentors and mentees, which is I have invested in you. So I believe that there's something in there with, with you. And so it makes sense for me to build a long-term relationship and see you succeed. It kind of applies in macro for us. Obviously, you know, it's not the same kind of one-to-one -one relationship that we have uh, as, as our mentors do. That one-to-one -one relationship is very important, but um, there, there's still like, you know, we have, um, we have you know, meetups with all our mentors and mentees uh, uh, periodically in, in our different cities that we make a point of attending. Um, it's like, it, it's, um, uh, it's, 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 Basically at this stage, particularly, it's about like building a bunch of people who are really like well and truly knotted together. And the business uh, model fits well with just that attitude. And we all enjoy that part of it. So that makes it all kind of align nicely together. I know you've been a fan of staying lean in terms of the startup world. How do you decide not to over engineer or how to even start by engineering? You just mentioned the prototype was just a bunch of resumes in a Google Drive. When do you decide to maybe create an app around it? Or maybe it's not the time yet. Let's wait and see if, if it's required. How do you decide that? I got to say here, um, Russell is one of the best startup engineers, I think, that yeah. exists because most engineers uh, have a bias towards let's build something. Whereas Russell actually <laughs> had the opposite bias where he's like, do we need to build this yet? And so, um, uh, which is unusual in, in a, a small founding team, uh, early on in particular, when we were kind of, not all of us were properly calibrated, Russell was actually the guy who was like, yeah, like, do we really need this right now? And sometimes the answer was yes, uh, but having a guy who asks that question uh, mm -hmm. probably saved us a, a, ton of, a ton of hours in terms of work. It, it's, it's sort of the difference between being a good uh, software engineer and being a good product person. And that's like, like the dream is you, you have both, but yeah. most people have just one or the other. And um, product is so counterintuitive because it's the art of managing finite resources in service to people who you may not know as well as you should. Um, so you're trying to meet a need that somebody else has. You can't read their mind. So you've got to try to elicit that information. And then you also have to not, not try to over-engineer. And as humans, we have a tendency to try to do whatever we can. If we have an ability, we'll try to exercise that ability. If we can build software, we'll try to build software. So it's very hard to rein that in and say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's a Google Drive folder. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like Russell, what, what's, your, like, what's your threshold on that? How, how do you make those? Uh, I would say one advantage of having no like explicit training in software engineering or development is that um, like, even if I wanted to over-engineer, um, you know, I, I probably couldn't because I'm still learning as I go. So sort of, there's a lot of like, let's just make this work because that's all I can handle uh, skill-wise. Um, but sort of the strategy for most of my time at Sharpest Minds has been like, Ed and Jeremy out there talking to users, sending emails, doing a lot of this work, and then me like slowly automating them uh, out of existence. and. Uh, Sometimes they really get pushed to their limits there, but uh, that's that's when you know it's time, right? Like we literally can't handle this doing manual work anymore, so we need to do something about it. That being said, it's like you know it's really easy to to fall into a trap and build um, build something that isn't really necessary. I think in the early days we were we were going down this rabbit hole building like scheduling software for getting our mentees and mentors to like to match together for interviews and. It's just a pain in the ass trying to integrate with different calendars and things like that. And then at some points, I'm not sure who brought it up, but it was like, wait, what problem are we really trying to solve? Are we building a scheduling software or are we trying to like make mentorships happen? Um, and so I think it, it, it helps sometimes to like take a step back and go like, what are we, what problem are we actually trying to solve? And is this the right thing to do it? I think that's that's a trick of not having built something that you can brag about to your hacker friends, but really solving a problem instead and looking at the macro picture. Yes. Oh yes. yeah. It, it's the the question is what's the loss function, and and the loss function <laughs> is, um, you know, it's it's what your users want. It's not what makes you feel good uh, all the time. Yeah. Definitely. Now, since you mentioned loss function, I'd like to shift the conversation towards data science. People, I'm sure, always approach you through all social media. How can you become a data scientist? I joke about it. I, I say you all you need is four rounds of interviews to become a data scientist. 
but uh, can we speak about how for example a person who's coming from i think i tweeted about this a, a recently a mentee who was a blacksmith became a data scientist how how can a person from a completely different background become a data scientist what all do they need and what all options do they have right so the the guy that i tweeted about and actually i i tweeted a response to this someone who asked about this too uh he, he so he wasn't coming at it from he wasn't like um you know he'd been a blacksmith in the 15th century and he got time traveled up <laughs> so he uh, his his story was more like he was a bit of a wanderer um he a long long time ago had done some com- computer science education uh, and then he'd started this like uh this artisanal uh business well selling artisanal goods um, some, some from other people and some his own, um, stuff like maintaining a website using a site builder. So he had a little bit of background uh, from a long time ago around CS and a little bit of modern background around business that he was able to leverage. Um, needless to say, the blacksmith to data science transition is a relatively infrequent transition. Um, so probably doesn't make sense for me to give specific advice of like, what if you were a blacksmith and trying to transition <laughs> to data science? Um, but the, the, a, more, a more common one is like, you know, you, uh, yeah, maybe you're a physicist transitioning over, maybe you're a software engineer transitioning over, maybe you're just like nothing in particular transitioning over. How do you go from a standing start? Um, Fast AI is a great starting point for this. If you have the self-discipline, of course, to maintain your way through a MOOC, um, there are, you know, solid boot camps out there that get you uh, to a good, like, starting level. Um, Frequently, the issues that one runs into is kind of you, you can often hit a plateau where you've done a bunch of tutorials and cycled over and over. You're like, okay, I've done this tutorial and then I've done this other tutorial. And like, I, I, the first few were good and I feel like I'm, I'm not learning really uh, very, very much. Um, the, the, the core of, of the advice is like, you want to be able, you want to build stuff and you want people to notice the stuff that you've built. Um, I've tweeted about this too, but that's like the kind of the core of it. Um, knowing what to build, like what's interesting, what kind of stuff people will notice is not always obvious from outside the industry. Um, you will, you, you can actually, um, we see this all the time um, in that uh, men, when our mentors and mentees get together for the first time and try to um, uh, hash out like what project is a mentee gonna build, you often have a situation where a mentee um, will not be able to propose a realistic project by themselves for no fault of their own. They just don't know like what is realistic to build and what's interesting. So a mentee might be like, I want to build a bot that predicts uh, cryptocurrency prices over blah, blah, blah. Um, this is like a really common idea, but it's an awful idea for, for, um, for a number of reasons that are not obvious to someone who's just, just entering the field. Um, and so that's kind of one of the reasons why just like having a mentor be like, no, don't w- spend your time um, for four months on this. This will not help you. Inspe- instead, use the valuable time that you have on this valuable thing instead. Um, and so it, it's, it, and, and it's, it's hard because um, the edge of the industry is actually a bit of a moving target. So being able to give advice that stands for a very long time, um, it's not necessarily always that realistic because uh, as you know as modeling uh, becomes better and better it becomes more about infrastructure and the data engineering around the modeling um, which is increasingly the case these days as you know very well from from h2o um, so so all that to kind of say that um, MOOCs and uh, and boot camps will get you kind of the 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 uh, most of the way there in terms of the the knowledge that you need um but you may depending on your uh your starting situation you may need you know a bit of extra to get you from what has been documented to the edge of the industry which is kind of the the moving target and and i will say also and this kind of circles around somewhat to the conversation we had about russell in terms of the product skill and then software engineering skill um that dichotomy also applies to data science it's really easy to think that, you know, as a data scientist, my job is going to be to make predictive models that are very accurate and performative. Um, in reality, you have an obligation not just to make good models, you have an obligation to spend your time as wisely as possible. And that means, um, unfortunately, data scientists can no longer afford to be purely technical people. You have to be able to have that business instinct. In a way, it's kind of like everybody's a startup founder. There's, <laughs> there's you know, the, yes. the, the best performing employees, the ones that, that cause their hiring managers the least anxiety when they bring them in to get interviewed are the ones who show that they're able to, to, to determine 
what, what activities are fun but a waste of time and what activities are maybe so simple that they seem too simple but they deliver real value. Sometimes getting, getting on five phone calls with five different users is more valuable than building a, a deep neural network to predict whether or not users will use your product. So that, that's sort of, um, I think a, a big aspect of this actually, and you know, Ed pointed out the, the um, uh, software engineering side of things, like how things are moving more in that direction too in, in terms of the infrastructure. I think there's a bit of a bifurcation too. Like we talk a lot to, uh, to data scientists uh, who are mentors who, who see this happening where you do have the engineering route, you also have the business and product route. And those are kind of, they're happening in tandem. The data scientist is becoming one of those two things increasingly um, as their time can be, can be spared by automation and better tooling. So anyway, just tossing that out there. I also want to point out people assume that a CS background is helpful. I, I said it publicly before and it sparked a lot of fire on Twitter at least. I did a computer science degree. It did not make me a better coder at all. It introduced its own biases. I don't know why even people have this perception. A CS degree might give you some theoretical knowledge if you were interested in that dinosaur age syllabus, even if you bothered to show up at the lecture and if you didn't hack your way around the grades, which I did and I'll publicly admit that. But yeah. for whosoever feels that a CS background is helpful, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think there's a sense in which, um, I mean, all different backgrounds contribute something, um, but definitely the idea that CS, those fundamentals are universally applicable. Um, yeah, I, I've seen as many challenges <laughs> for mentees with CS backgrounds as for mentees with others, let's say. The one thing the CS background might help with is, you know, getting by automated resume screens and, and maybe the odd like exactly. whiteboarding technical interview, right? So in that sense, it might give you a leg up, like, uh, getting your feet in the door, but as far as like uh, once you're on the ground running, like I, I don't think it contributes that much unless you're, you know, doing something deeply technical. Um, yeah. Yes, I, I, I completely agree. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there are uh, there are signaling benefits to it certainly, uh, and yeah, for for the certain kinds of whiteboard interviews, even for data science, are still like sort this linked list. It's like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the way it is. It, well, it, I think it's part of the, the problem with that is that companies are still to this day trying to figure out how to hire for data science, yeah. scientists, right? So there's like this notion that data scientists are people who code. Okay, so what test do we give to the other people who have to code? Oh, we give them this test? Okay, let's give them the same test then. And it's like, it's not well calibrated necessarily, but uh, yeah. It does happen. I think for startups, it makes sense. And I was trying to think about this. If you want to hire a person who spent a few thousand dollars on education and learn something that another person who by themselves for free in a self-motivated yeah. fashion has learned the same thing. Why wouldn't you hire the first person? And yet hiring is broken. Like you mentioned. There's, yeah. There's like, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of signals that go into it. If you've done a CS degree, you are in a way signaling, um, I can afford to spend four years outside of the workforce on learning. Like it's, it's, it sounds really silly, but a large amount of, um, mm -hmm. of the way that we evaluate each other is through this kind of a uh, proof of work or like proof of effort type stuff. And it's, it's pretty performative. It's just like, yeah, look at like, look at the amount of chips I was able to put on the table onto the data science slot or whatever it is. And, um, you know, that's like, that, that matters. It, it matters because it means you've actually put yourself out there to a big extent. You've taken a big risk with your time and your effort. And there's also though a, I think a, a pretty decent ingredient here, which is just human tribalism. Um, if you're a person who gets a CS degree, like I, I've, I remember having a chat and it sound name, name droppy here, but I really don't mean it that way. I had a chat with one of the, the lead data scientists at Airbnb, and this was about a year ago. And what he told me was we, at the time, uh, the team hires, focuses on hiring um, PhDs. Why? Because our founding, um, our founding kind of data science team member had a PhD. And so everybody has this idea that this is what it takes to be as great as I am at X, Y, or Z. And, um, and, and that kind of mentality, that gatekeeping is something that I think is starting to break down. I, th I think boot camps are sort of showing that that's not actually a a rational way of approaching this stuff, but we probably have a long ways to go yet. 
So I I've already established how universities are broken I continuously like to put it out there even though thankfully my dad paid for my tuition fees I want <laughs> to talk course. about another thing how MOOCs are broken people look up to MOOCs really now and during our previous conversation Jeremy had mentioned now that everyone is doing MOOCs how do you stand out So I one of, one of my favorite themes in my blog has been how not to do a MOOC where and the thing people miss out is these are made for selling even though it's really cheap compared mm-hmm. to university degree they are being sold and it might look attractive based on some twitter project that you might see why might, might want to take up another mooc then you go to another mooc to learn pytorch then you want to learn how to deploy something so you take up another mooc on that and you don't end up building anything at all so i I'd, i'd like to talk about how can we establish the balance between taking up a mooc for example similar to fast ai and then figuring out how to put a signal so to speak a true signal on your resume the um uh so i have one one quick thing that i do with with my mentees actually at the beginning of every week and i've i've heard this uh being done by other mentors too like the very first thing is you want to make sure that you're keeping your your end goal in mind so if if your goal is to get hired as let's say a data scientist um or a machine learning engineer then what you want to do is essentially create uh, a bunch of training labels with that data and train against them. So what do I mean by this? I mean go to a jobs board, find five jobs that you find really compelling that you think are realistic and you think you'd be really interested in working at and then make a list of the technical requirements for all those jobs. Look at the most common ones, the ones that show up regularly and then make sure that you're building projects that hit those skills and um and then doing MOOCs that hit those skills. And like you really want to prune what you're doing as much as possible and focus on project building rather than MOOCs because the project building as long as you're building a project that hits those skills you know that you're doing something that's constructive um you're not as likely to get stuck in that awful MOOC spiral where you keep you know self doubt and imposter syndrome cause you to just keep keep spinning your wheels yeah one of the things um one of the things that that projects do is that they kind of pull in your knowledge if i need to know this to do a thing I'm not just like rote going through a MOOC. I'm actually learning it with intentionality. Um, the one of the main reasons why this kind of endless MOOC loop often happens is that um, a MOOC is like it, it's sort of like War and Peace. It's an aspirational purchase. It's like I I am buying this book um, or I'm buying this MOOC because it represents the sort of person I want to be. um it beyond just like i want war and peace on my shelf so people think i'm smart it's like i'm buying war and peace because i want to believe that i'm the sort of person who's going to read it to the end um but uh it turns out that it's quite hard as we talked about at the beginning of this it's hard to sustain yourself through an entire thing like a mooc um in the absence of stuff like peer groups to help you in the absence of um a whole bunch of like habit type stuff certain kinds of people can do it but for the average person um it's it's just very very difficult and so uh building a project is at least something that makes you go like well i i got to dive into this mooc to build the thing i'm trying to build so i have to learn something and, and also i mean the the m in mooc is all the hint that you need um that that this is not something that will allow you to stand out i mean it's a massive online open course there are thousands tens of thousands of people actually doing this exact same course putting it on their linkedin profile put you know build the whatever the standard you know mooc project is that you build with this mooc and recruiters have seen these things done to to death i mean they're bored of them hiring managers aren't impressed by them um and as you said saying i mean this it's they're meant to be sold they're meant to be sold en masse which right. it doesn't mean they're bad which doesn't mean they're bad yeah. it just it more means like they're table stakes so like yeah. you have to know the stuff somehow um uh but just like it's not like oh i did this mooc therefore i'm hireable exactly yeah. i i think uh, the other point that comes across is uh, so and now the fast day community it's it's a very open community in the sense that it's similar to reading books i think Nawal said how he approaches book is he reads a book until he gets bored of it and we were discussing this recently on the fast ai uh, community that you can do a few lectures you can get bored of them or you can think of an idea it's okay to go back and forth mm-hmm. and I, I, the end goal would be to build a project as soon as you get the idea ditch the course go to building it come back if you need to learn something 
but the reward signal so to speak that you're getting from taking off a lecture and maybe you have a yes. fancy mooc that fills up the progress bar isn't really making you progress in terms of the real world it's more likely to cause you to overfit to the particular perspective that's being taught in that mooc and not generalize yeah now coming 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 to the idea of how do you find your passion project uh, and i i know you mentioned this always on how you can leverage your background in whatever background life you coming from before you even discovered data science how do you find your passion project that might be worth selling so to speak to a recruiter or a startup i mean genuine interest uh is the starting point um there actually there there sorry there are two possible starting points one is genuine interest because that will keep you going through the inevitable barriers that you're going to bump into as you work on a project like oh i can't figure this thing out i hate i hate this this sucks but i'm so interested in the subject matter i want to keep going um you want those two forces or you want the the the, the motive force operating um the second thing is the experience that you already have if you have some some prior experience even if it's not you know anything that feels material even if it's like hey like i was uh you know i i was a a sales person on the floor at macy's or something like that i you know i just like sold clothes um but because i sold clothes i interacted closely with a lot of the customers at macy's and i found that they all kind of wanted the same things So what I did was I took this data set of like clothing um like fashion data set and uh I I like built this thing that instead of building a recommender system that uses collaborative filtering to recommend clothes uh I built a recommender system that helps you complete an outfit because I found like that's what customers actually want and this is really interesting to me if I'm a hiring manager I'm like oh my goodness ooh this is a person who um has actually thought through the the fusion of um uh you know cold hard data with talking to warm you know heart beating people and understands how to put those two things together in a way that people might really want and what i'm describing here is actually a real thing and a real project that one of our mentees actually did and used to get hired as a as a data scientist um at a uh, a fashion retailer he was actually like I want to get hired in fashion so much and I'm so into fashion that he he basically built this entire recommender to be like here's a new way of recommending clothes and look you know your website is doing this the wrong way he actually took this to them he was like you guys are doing this wrong here's what people actually want and they had no choice but to hire him because what else could they possibly do um if you can create that it kind of comes back to you are your own startup if you can both like talk to people build stuff and um in a way kind of sell things or or understand how they 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 create value for real people um it, you're you're basically unstoppable um people are going to fight to hire you and I, i think that really does highlight to the importance of that that uh, business instinct that we were talking about um it's like it's the best way hands down to to distinguish yourself from the competition when the competition is a bunch of people who've done a, a million moocs and who are relying on that as their main argument for why they should be hired that's the median person the median applicant like you know it's true that there are hundreds of applicants per role but the median applicant is a mooc spiral person that's just been kind of on this nonstop and you know maybe a couple casual competitions here and there but the um the key really is as ed hinted at here as well novelty and originality like the best projects are projects that no one else has done that you have gone out and collected the data data for and that's a great way to signal that you're just the kind of person who doesn't let the absence of good data prevent you from building something if you're passionate about it or building something if you need to build it out for say an employer um it's kind of the idea yeah yeah i would say one of the best um you know places to look for passion projects is in whatever sort of hobbies that outside of work that you're interested in and that's i think from all the mentees that have come through sharpest minds that's where we see the most interesting things um because that's something you're already passionate about you've got some sort of insider knowledge already or like domain specific knowledge which we all know uh goes a long way with data science right because you already kind of have a sense uh of the questions you want to answer you maybe have some hypothesis of what the answers will be 
Um, and chances are there's some other folks out there with the same sort of hobbies that will be really interested in the thing you've built because, you know, the internet's a big place and there's a niche community for everything. So whatever hobby you have, you can probably think of something that will be interesting to other people. Um, some notable examples, I think one of our mentees built like a hiking trail recommendation system. Uh, one of my mentees, super into politics, like ended up scraping uh, the government's website for all the bills and like uh, creating like embeddings of all our members of parliament uh, and, and plotting some real cool stuff there. And he was able to ask these really cool questions because he had a deep understanding of, of the domain. And um, yeah, sometimes I think you can be surprised by the amount of, of knowledge you have in some of your non data science related hobbies. For sure. And I think people miss out on this obvious topic. I, I used to be silly about this. I'll admit it that I, I would mention that, hey, I've done 50 courses. So what, <laughs> well, what have I achieved outside of it? And uh, we just talked about uh, your adventure in the startup world, so to speak. No one waits until they know and have it all figured out before they even, for example, approach Y Combinator. They try to build a minimal working thing that they barely have some idea about and they have an intuition. And then they approach the investors. I think it's it's similar, pretty similar in the job world as well. You try to build a minimal project that somehow works and you maybe get a taste of the field and then you somehow convince the other end person to maybe put some money into you. This, this is exactly right. Uh, and I wish more people understood this. Um, when an employer hires you, they are making an investment in you. They are saying like, it's exactly as if you were a little startup and you were getting some money from an investor. They are saying, okay, we'll take a bet on you. We're going to bet a hundred thousand dollars or tens of thousands of dollars a year, a substantial amount of money that you are going to generate more than that for us in value in ROI. Like you're the, the it's, it's actually like a mini pitch. You're like a little startup. You're, you're pitching yourself. You're like, yes, I can probably generate more money for you in the long run then you're going to pay me because if you couldn't do that it wouldn't make sense for you, for them to hire you so they're evaluating you as an investment think of it that way um Sanyan, you're a hundred percent right about this and and I, I will say um and here i'm just i'm just shamelessly stealing uh some of the advice i've seen ed give on resumes too like this has implications for the way that you market your past experience you at at the you know in the best of cases you should be able to frame your past experiences in terms of dollar signs. You should be able to say, hey, I worked at this company and I created like $200,000 of value. Well, guess what? I mean, that, what, what better argument could you have for making the case that you deserve $150,000 in salary? Um, it, you know, it's just math. And if you're bringing in more than you cost, then you're an asset. And um, so anyway, putting some time into thinking about how you can quantify these things can be really helpful. I think other other ways to find passion projects and uh, I was just so recently the Tesla stock has been in news. Maybe you could build a Elon Musk mood versus Tesla stock predictor. Who knows that could chain off some ideas. If you're writing on medium, maybe you could scrape the front page every day and figure out what titles might get you on the front page. It may or may not work, but it might be an interesting project and could lead to realistic uh, other ideas as well. Or it could be something interesting. I, I would personally love to talk about uh, with a person that I'm interviewing who puts such a project on their resume. Yeah, uh, even if even if it doesn't work, right? There's so many lessons along the way that you learn, right? And um, there's actually so much value in explaining to something like why didn't the solution work? Like why did this fail? These are the lessons I've learned, and, and you can tell a lot about how much someone knows by by the kind of answers they give to those questions. And, and I do think that there's a lot to be said for um, not focusing, not focusing so much on just the outcome of the trying to get hired process. Like, uh, you know, if you, if you think of yourself, like I'm going to be disappointed in myself if I don't get hired as a data scientist by date X, like you're already sowing the seeds for a very brutal journey because ultimately you can't control that directly. What you can control is what you do today, what you do in the next five minutes. So if you set yourself goals that are realistic for what you can accomplish today and you do it and you can find a way to reward yourself for it psychologically, like that feels fulfilling, 
that's the spot you want to be in. Those, those big long stretch goals are, they can be pretty dangerous. I think even the Kaggle community has been open about it, especially the top Kagglers and to offend some academicians, at least the top papers do mention of the things that don't work. And maybe some people pick up and I know the smart researchers don't just go ahead and say, okay, this did not work. Why did this not work? That's how even research and academia works, at least the top tier. You need, you need negative training uh, examples as well as positive training examples. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Talking about hiring, uh, I think we all can agree hiring is broken. And uh, I want to talk about what all things do you need to learn about when you're approaching, when you think you're ready to put something on your resume and you're ready to approach uh, hiring managers. And when will you know that you're ready to approach hiring managers? Hmm. When do you know if you're ready to approach hiring managers? If you're ready to apply for a job, I like to think of approaching people because uh, it's, it's, I, I personally yeah. believe it leads to more uh, percentage chances of you getting hired. It's, it's, it's correct. I can absolutely, our data reflects this. It is correct. Um, yes, approaching people uh, through email or through any medium other than, you know, job boards is, is more effective, um, usually yeah. on, a, on a yield per effort basis. It, to, um, to put numbers to it, it's like our A-B tests show about a 1% to 2% conversion rate from a job board application to an interview. So if you're doing better than 50 to 100 applications per interview, you're, you're actually doing well. Yeah, and even 1% to 2% is like pretty high. Like you actually have to have some experience to get to that point. Um, yeah, and then for you to know when it's the right time for you to contact hiring manager, um, like you, it's kind of like when you've done um, a, a project or two, the thing is like, you can also ease into it um, and use the local environment as a way of uh, getting that information. Um, you don't have to just like, okay, I've been doing a bunch of MOOCs and I did a bunch of projects. Uh, I'm going to reach out to a bunch of hiring managers. Oh my God, this is so nerve wracking. Um, instead, if you live, particularly if you live in uh, a, you know, a city of any size and description um, in any, with any kind of tech community, there will often be meetups there. Um, there are uh, people in most cities, like culturally, will be open to just like, if you reach out on LinkedIn politely and say, hey, I'm looking for advice on like breaking into data science. Um, here are proofs that I have done a lot of work up to this point. Um, so I'm not just a bozo, I, you know, I'm not just MOOC, I've done a little bit more than uh, the bare minimum. And take that advice and just keep applying and taking that advice. And you eventually can build up like a network and at least um, get some feedback from people who say, hey, um, I actually think you're pretty good. It's like a slow step-by-step uh, -step climb, but it, it is a climb, like you, it is a, it's a process. And if you focus on the step-by-step -step improvements, and, and don't focus on like, I need to be hired by date X, um, which, which, you know, you have no idea how realistic it is for you to be hired by date X. So focus on the, the step-by-step -step improvements and use the feedback from your environment. I, I, I just I, add, I, sorry, sorry just add one thing that I see as a, a barrier for a lot of folks who are looking for their first job is they're, they're put off by the job descriptions. Um, <laughs> and it's something we have to hammer in all the time. It's like, that's, that's very much a wish list, not like a set of rigid requirements. So, so don't be scared if you're not hitting every single item on that, that job description. Yeah. I'll, I'll share one trick that I, I shouldn't be sharing though, but I think uh, applying to jobs and this, this creates a stress for a lot of people interviewing the process itself. And I, I believe it's a muscle that you need to exercise constantly. So while I was in my undergrad, I'd apply to even senior roles and think of, I think of it as free practice interviews. What's, what's the worst I, as it is, I'm not going to get the job, but interestingly, I did get to final rounds of senior, uh, positions as well. And the only thing I did was I did not lie on my resume. I removed the university line from my resume, which did not tell them that, Hey, I'm a university student. Although they did kick me off in the final round when they discovered they did. But I think you can also think of interviews as free practice interviews. There are plenty of companies out there. The field's not going away and mm -hmm. you can apply to every single position out there. This is the way to think about it. Absolutely. Because what it does is it, lowers the expectations that you are setting for yourself. And the hardest thing is when your expectations are here and your performance is here. And 
people try to just like scrabble their way up to their performance matching their expectations but that's that's like you, your motivation erodes as you do that because it's so demoralizing. Instead, like relax, let it go, let your expectations drop. And then once your performance is above the level of your expectations, it's the same as we were talking about at the beginning when Russell mentions like setting an absolute minimal bar for yourself. It's all about like releasing your expectations. And there, you know, there's a reason that you became interested in data science, right? There's a reason that you're interested in this. And so let that interest be your driving force. Watch yourself as you improve and let your improvement encourage you as opposed to like having this big mismatch of expectations. And it's hard for folks to, to let that go in that way. But ultimately, like it's, it's the thing that's most crucially important and that carries you through every uh, level of success that you can get in your life. And this is like when, when we kind of failed the first time, like going back to the beginning of the conversation 18 months ago or whatever it was. Um, that's kind of what happened. We were like, well, okay, we failed. So like, okay, great. We're failures. So our expectations are like now rock bottom. And so that means like we have nothing to lose. We can just like try stuff and, and we're free. We're free. And so lowering your expectations is a source of freedom. And I think another aspect of this too is um because there's almost this paradoxical relationship as well between if you're doing interviews how far you get in the interview process and how disappointed you are in yourself for not landing the job we refer to this as the funnel paradox internally but basically it's this idea that you know if if you apply to a job and you get rejected before you even get interviewed how do you feel well you go eh, okay whatever i have a hundred other applications just like this one um, let's say you get the behavioral interview and you then <laughs> fail after the behavioral interview. You're like, oh man, you know, that, that kind of sucks. I mean, I, you know, I spent an hour. What, what are you going to do? Um, and then you get deeper and deeper. And then like I've, t- I've been on, on uh, conversations with mentees where they're like, man, I like, I got it to the final on site. I didn't get it. And now I'm in this, like, I'm in this depressive funk. And if, and that's what happens when you set your goal to be, I'm, I'm hired or I, I'm unhappy. Whereas if you took a step back and rewarded yourself like, a, like an RL agent um, with, with a, a, an actual time delay, you would tell yourself, oh my God, look at this. I made an on-site interview, just like you did, Sanyam, with the, the senior data scientist roles. Like, <laughs> that, that's an accomplishment, and it means you're not that far off from, from making it all the way. Um, so you can really grind your gears into the pavement if you're not careful with that um, and thinking about what your, what your goals are really matters there. And I, 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 since you just mentioned it, I, I'd like to think of it as your Tinder profile. You're not getting right size because maybe your profile picture isn't good. Maybe your resume isn't good. That's why you're not making it across the round. Maybe you're a good person or you're good at whatever job you're there out looking for on Tinder or otherwise. Maybe yeah. it's your profile picture that's not helping you out or your resume otherwise. Yeah, yeah. You are not your resume. Yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, this has been full of amazing stories and advices. I'd like to ask you for one final best advice for someone who maybe got motivated through this episode or otherwise to start their journey uh, today or tomorrow. Final piece of advice for, for someone who is just starting from scratch. Starting the, I, I think, applicable to anyone from any background, similar to any mentees that is at sharpest minds now, what advice would you have? Right. Um, I think that a really broadly applicable advice, we touched on this, but it's really important. Uh, start by lowering your expectations and begin with the minimal thing. And so that you will let, like, um, you, the, the rise from that point is much more natural and less effortful. Uh, than then try to reach a goal that you don't know how far away from it you are. Um, this like the, the, the energy comes from you rather than being drained out of you if you do it that way. I think um, I, I think I would just say tr- train against reality as much as possible. So you want to you want to try to keep checking in with yourself to reorient yourself with respect to your long term goal. Um, and back propagate to what your short term goals should be. So if you're interested in landing a particular kind of job, um, sure, you can, you know, go do a bunch of MOOCs aimlessly. But what you really want to do is find the job descriptions for the jobs you're interested in, 
back propagate to figure out what are the skills I need and then work on those. Um, yeah, as much as possible training against reality. Awesome. Uh, I'll chime in, I guess, with something that we've said over and over again on this episode, which is uh, like focus on process rather than product and, and habits over goals. So there's, it's kind of this nice piece of advice that we hold at sharpest minds uh, for both our business and for the advice we give our mentees. Like, don't focus on the outcome, focus on what you're doing every day uh, and try and get intrinsic reward from that and the results will follow. Awesome. Uh, I'd, I'd like to drop a quick plug for you all. Please follow Ed on Twitter for amazing sharpest mind stories and startup stories. Please follow Russell for push to production Friday motivation and other ideas that he keeps sharing. And also check out Jeremy's uh, Twitter handle, who's slightly less active. And I hope you become more active soon on Twitter. Uh, any other platforms that you'd like to mention? I'll definitely have Russell your uh, blog linked in the description. Any other platforms that I'm missing out? Uh, maybe at sharpestminds.com if you're looking for a good sure. <laughs> yes. I think we all have like mediums and LinkedIn's as well. And I think they'll be, they'll all be accessible from any one node in that network of social media stuff. Yes. I'd, do you feel free to add me on LinkedIn? I'd also recommend your newsletter, which I'm really enjoying by the way. So I'll have that linked also in the description. I'm delighted. Um, I, I haven't put out new uh, newsletters in the last couple of weeks because we are hiring and that's kind of consuming a lot of our cycles. But once we brought that person aboard, uh, that will free up some time again for the newsletter. Awesome. Thank you so much team, all three of you for joining me on the podcast and for this amazing conversation all about startup world and hiring and data science. Thanks Thank so much for having us. Sanya. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.